think I'm drunker than I intended to be. Uh, <laughs> right, um, so this talk is about my game, Pop Methodology Experiment 1, and this is an informative talk about the implications of ludographic manifesta manifestation through creative output and surveying objurgation of the modern systems of development, aesthetics, and subsequent user experiences with interactive media, particularly the digital game. Um, but this is not what it's about, fuck that. Uh, it's about Rob Locke, American hero, as uh, a lone American developer, it seems. Um, so what does this talk about? It's about guns being the best and being me. Um, and this all leads to also what Pop Methodology Experiment 1 is actually about. Um, there's a, I just put this painting in here, which is one of my favorite artists. He draws like really obnoxiously patriotic <laughs> paintings where Obama's stepping on the Constitution and everyone's pointing <laughs> to the lone American in front of the White House. And of course, like Clinton and Roosevelt is clapping for Obama stepping, oh, sorry. Um, so this game is essentially a methodology experiment where sort of the typical game development methodology, you start with like a concept and then you sort of build up your initial tech and then you sort of flesh out the design and then you start working on the visual so, and visuals and sound effects and then you end with music and then you end with a product. Uh, of course, it's usually more parallel, parallelized, and it's more complicated than this if you have music, and depends, yeah. Um, it's more complicated than that, what I showed, but for the purposes of this talk, I'll leave it as this. And if you're a good developer, you iterate until it's good. Um, but my methodology experiment is, the first thing I made was the music, and then during the music creation process, I come up with the concept of the game. Um, I think if any creative process, like there are moments where you start thinking about other creative media that would go with this. Um, and even just like in everyday life, say you're sitting on a train, you can sort of start picturing a soundtrack to what's going on. So I sort of exploited this creative sort of parallel um, lateral thinking um, for the game and to come up with the concepts for the game. So my development process was I first created the whole soundtrack for the game. And then from those concepts, I created all the art, and then I, I sat down and designed how the games would operate. And then the last thing I did was built the technology to run it all. Uh, and then instead of iterating, I just went back and made sure it all worked. So there's, it's all just raw output from the conceptual stage. Um, so that's basically the premise. Uh, and then the M16 slash AR-15 rifle, uh, how do I go back? <laughs> okay, so the M16 AR-15 rifle is the most popular rifle in the United States. It's made in the USA, and it fires 700 to 950 rounds per minute. Um, it fires the 223 Remington for the civilian market and the 5.56 millimeter NATO round for the military market. And um, I thought I should put this in here because I'm in Texas. Uh, and I think you guys need information <laughs> about guns. Um, and then there's some freedom pro tips. Uh, express yourself with the AR-15, customize it. So here you see uh, Hello Kitty AR-15. And you notice like the, the handle, it's like slanted back. That's for the California market because you can't have um, pistol grips in California. So they, this is like a weird loophole where you just slant it back enough and then it becomes a rifle grip. Uh, and then wild barrels allow you to fire both 223 Remington and 556 five, NATO. And avoid cheap ammo, mainly because it's usually coated steel casing, which is corrosive to most barrels. Um, it increases your jam rate because the casings are more abrasive and there's more friction. And they're not made in the USA, which is a bad thing to have. So what is POP about? Um, I guess first we should explore who I am. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's me. Um, well, my background is, is that, I guess I should first talk about sort of the duality of game development, where the, one of the reasons I went into games is that it's a nice balance between the art side and the technical side. 
Uh, I'm like a developer that works solo, so I make the art and the music and the game and the, the technical, the, the programming as well. Um, and that's I think uh, I think it's pretty common amongst game developers, even from like a programming standpoint. Uh, a game encompasses so much, so many different areas of technology that if you're interested in programming, making a game requires you to uh, work outside of your comfort zones and it allows you to work with graphics and input and everything. Um, so at, from my engineering side, I studied computer science at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, I make games because they allow expression of technical ability uh, and, and I explore games development technically. And that's my engineering side of me. And then there's the artist side of me, which where I made music at UIUC. And then um, I also did like graphic design. Uh, I make games because they allow expression of creative ability and explore game development aesthetically. There's also a third side of, third, third of, of me where uh, I have a degree in philosophy as well. And I make games because they're the most important creative media of our t in our time. And I, I believe that immensely. And I, I sort of write personally about this. And I, uh, at some point, I wish to express these feelings in a more formal setting. Um, and then explore games uh, development as theory, cultural identity, and feminography. <laughs> and that femin phenomenography is a study of um, other people's experiences uh, through like an empirical method. And I believe games are the best way to study that. Um, so my gun safe has three guns in it. One is a Rock River Arms AR-15 as an 18 inch wild barrel, as I suggested, that's a good purchase. Um, as a buy point, uh, a bipod with a aim point red dot, with red dot optics, which um, I also have a three times magnification. So I can shoot pretty accurately up to 200 yards, which is in any case more than I need. And I have uh, five 30 round magazines, according to the Stanag standard, which is the NATO standard, which holds both 5.56 five, and 2.23. I also have a Remington 870 shotgun and 12 gauge, which is sort of the he home defense specialty. And then a CZ 75 pistol, which is made in the Czech Republic, um, which just feels great to me. So the goals of POP. Um, before I made POP, I was working on a project for over a year, and it's about 10% done. And it, it was massive in that aspect. So this was really a personal project to get me back into making smaller games. And then because I am formally educated as a programmer and I sort of dabbled in music and dabbled in art, um, I, I tried to create a sort of a project where it forced me to work more in the art and musical sense um, than the, the programming sense, which is why like the IGF build of this game was programmed in like six days, whereas everything else took like two months. Um, and that's one of the best ways to learn anything is just work outside of your comfort zone. And then you just keep, keep at it and basically any skill is dependent on practice. Um, and then from the first two points, um, sort of lead into my third point is where I wanted to experiment with game development methodology. Um, I worked at Electronic Arts before I went to Indy and they were all about like development pipelines and making things work right and like making things produced quickly um, and getting a high-end product. But I think there's this sort of like hive mind of how you develop a game and exploring how just the, the, just the basic process and the order you do things really changes how a game is made. Um, and I wanted to explore that. And then, I did, and then my, uh, my fourth point is create something that is culturally relevant. Um, I think a lot of indie developers think about this. Um, like I think two days ago I was talking with Terry and he was talking about uh, sequels and how sequels don't add to the cultural relevancy of your game. And, and I was very surprised when I was, I was picking up on this because this is like important to me. Um, like games are such a cultural thing at this point and, and there's such infancy. There's no reason you shouldn't be just constantly pushing like the bubble of what games mean, which leads me to my last point is extending the definition of what a game is. Um, like the definition of what games are is not set in stone and we're in s such an early point in our industry where 
there really needs to be people pushing along the edges to figure out what's just just to create sort of the boundaries of what games are, and the boundaries aren't in sight. So one of the points of this project was to push against those boundaries. Um, so pop, um, no one understood really what pop was about, which is why I don't like it. Um, pop is philosophy of play. And if you read interviews and they ask me what pop means, I always lie to them. But now you guys really know. It's about the philosophy of, philosophy of play. And um, each vignette in pop is a different philosophical doctrine or movement. Um, for instance, the, 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 the rock, well, you can sort of see this slide. Each one um, depends. Wiley, don't take a picture of this. This is like a cheat sheet. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, so every game is based on a different uh, philosophical doctrine or movement. And um, this seems sort of like pretentious or intellectual or some, some bullshit like that. But really, this is not special. Every game enforces a philosophical system on the player, intentionally or not. Um, most games, uh, how do we go back? Most games are based on moral objectivism, where you try to increase your own sort of, um, like your own score, let's say, um, reg uh, regardless of anything else that's going on. And um, if you're gonna make a fun game based on moral objectivism, um, if you don't know what any of these things mean, that, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can, if you want to talk to me afterwards or ask me questions after I finish this talk, go ahead. I can go back to this slide. But um, as I said, this is not special. I was just aware of what I was doing. And I think about like, um, the ph philosophical implications of every game that's developed quite a bit. And I'm not sure anyone else does that. But um, I think there's a lot to explore um, basing your games on, on different philosophical systems. And just, um, yeah, there's a lot of exploration to be had there. Um, so Home Defense 101. Uh, use a shotgun. It's easy to operate and it's harder to miss. Uh, you know, like, like rifles or pistols, if you miss with like a rifle, you, c you can kill like 10 people, you know, it, like they, ju they just go through all the plaster walls. Uh, use birdshot or home defense specialty shells. Um, they minimize collateral damage. Um, even though you think a shotgun does a lot of damage, it's a low velocity round. So like you, you might go through one wall. Uh, you don't want to kill like your girlfriend or daughter in the next room. Um, and then we weapon mounted flashlights are great because they disoriented, uh, disorient a home intruder. Um, if like home intrusions usually happen at night, so you want to be looking around and like turning on lights um, is, is like, you can either turn on the light or you can use a flashlight to blind them. Um, and then I guess this is more for the business people, um, but the greatest success of Pop, which is the one thing I'm proud of, like the greatest thing I'm proud of of this game, is that um, expanding the audience. Um, let me go through in through some sales data, which might be interesting and I think is relevant. Um, I use a pay what you want sale with a d like physical incentives at different price points. So at like $5, I, I included a pin and I mailed them out at, at $10. I had a pin plus like a sticker sheet at 25. You had all those things plus a t-shirt. And uh, like this, that, that was totally worth it um, sales wise. Um, around 21% of sales referrals came from non-gaming rela related sources. Um, like when I marketed this game, I, uh, uh, I pushed it towards more art and design uh, than actual gaming sites. And um, I think on coolhunting.com, I was the first game they featured uh, for since like 2006. Um, and that's like a art and design blog. And that got picked up by a bunch of different art and design blogs. Uh, and this is something really interesting uh, you will see in a second. And then, like, feedback-wise, I was getting a lot of feedback saying, like, uh, I got a lot of people that were nostalgic about games and got jaded by them by recent releases. Um, so I got a lot of feedback saying, this is, like, finally a game I'd like to play, uh, which is interesting. So my sales data, uh, as you can see, art and design sites, the average price that came from that was $8.66, and my suggested price was $5. And I did a pay what you want from $1 to $10,000. Um, so 
yeah, you can read into that as much as you want. Um, gaming sites were the lowest price point, and then direct slash social media, um, that those like friends and stuff. So they weren't as cheap as the average gamer. Uh, but percentage-wise, most of my sales came from gaming sites, but around 20% came from art and design sites. But revenue-wise, the sales I got from art and design sites was greater than the gaming sites, even though it was a majority of my sales. Um, and then my direct slash social sales were pretty, just whatever. <laughs> um, so my pay what you want average was $3.56, which was mainly influenced by the sales from art and design referrals. Um, physical incentives were worth it, as I was mentioning earlier. And uh, gamers are cheap. Um, so if you're making sort of a niche game, uh, try to push it towards more the art slash design. Like try to push your marketing towards that end. Because those people, like th that, that crowd respects uh, games more financially at least. Uh, and then some gun data. This is data of number of guns versus number of murders per country. And as you can see, the USA isn't that bad. Um, like you can notice like Iceland, there's like one murder a year or something like that. I don't know, like someone gets thrown in a, vol like a volcano or something. Um, but uh, <laughs> like the US, because they have so much guns, their gun death to gun ownership rate is surprisingly uh, well off compared to other countries. So if, if people just own more guns, our rate will be better. Um, so we see that blue line? If we can increase that like way to like 90,000, then like, you know, statistically, there won't be that many gun deaths. Uh, so that's the end. Thank you. Uh, wow, I only, like, that's 23 minutes. So I was like 20, okay, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to talk about. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> uh, Evan? Thank you. Um, I, I don't know who that is. Like, can someone give him a microphone or something? I don't know. Or just yell, yell, yell a question out. Yeah. Uh, I've got the microphone here. Who has a question? There you go. So talking about, um, you said every game has a philosophical doctrine and uh, methodology. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I, I was just curious. So what do you feel would be that doctrine or philosophy like with Pac-Man? Would that be greed or? Yeah. Like I was scared of putting a slide up because I don't think I'm intellectually competent enough to sort of analyze a game like immediately. Uh, it's like to really analyze something, you have to like beat through it and so and really figure out each thing. Um, most early games were based on, like, morally on objectivism, and um, they're structuralist in a way that um, there is no self. You're, it's usually abstracted. Uh, and then you're just playing within a rule set. So, like, Tetris is purely a structuralist game where the only, the only, only entity in the game is the rule set you're working in. I, like, I, I don't know, like, I, I think I'm too drunk to talk about philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning a lot. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, if you want to talk to me after, <laughs> we, we, can, we can talk all day if you want. Any other questions about guns? <laughs> Do you have any, uh, any pop uh, gameplay footage you can I share? can play the game. Like, I can beat just, it. Yeah, just, just play the game. That's what we want to see. Uh, Let's play the game while we shoot at you. Uh, let me find it. I can play my Adventure Time game. It's loaded up right here. Up. Uh, Rob also took part in our first fantastic arcade game making frenzy game jam, which happened last weekend. It was all uh, 48 hours to make all Adventure Time themed games. And a little later on, we're going to have uh, the best of some of those games on an arcade cabinet out here. Um, let me find it. I have so many versions of it, I have to. Uh, this should work. Maybe. I can beat the game in like 
15 minutes, so... Oh, if anyone is, uh, has epilepsy, leave the room. Like, I have my game on online, and it's the only game with a uh, <laughs> sensitivity warning. It's kind of awesome. I can tell you everything you need to know about the game. Once inside the arcade world, you actually control the game with keyboards and mice. And one thing you can do is hitting the keyboard. Press Z. Arrow. Keys. Okay, so we're good. So rather than relying on a keyboard, or we need to keys. Use the mouse. When we said reality will never be the same. Okay, those are just instructions again. I'm skipping back. This is a million times. I don't know if I should fail this game or pass it. Because I I'm just gonna fail now. This is like I'm too good at this. This time frame of exaggerated steering commands and control system responses registered in telemetry data. At approximately 73 seconds. The win to win that game is to not shoot anyone because you're not supposed to be killing civilians. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not fun that way. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, and the mechanics of that game are not very obvious by design. Movies, um, or parties, or I won't tell you how it works. And you leave your boyfriend enough money so he'll ask you again. <laughs> Number three packaging machine still down. Oh, no, I was afraid of that. establishment propaganda read it anyway I'm going to cheat at this one cuz it takes a long time
Yes, Walter found out that nobody thinks very much of a man who talks against the company he works for. And what did I Walter really like gain by making cards? that false statement about his company? Nothing. That's the end of Pop. This is the final screen. Okay. Anyone have any other questions? I see a lot of people playing it. Please don't. Everything you did came from your own perception, obviously, but how much of it is like directly from your own experiences? Um, well, I guess... Yeah, were you a, a black astronaut, Rob? <laughs> um, well, I've only been to the moon twice. Um, so... Yeah, no, <laughs> um, I guess everything... It, every single game comes from... I don't, I don't know how to explain this. Um, 
like they're, they're like if you're making like when you're doing something if the if the if the concepts come to you um, without any effort they're always coming from some place that's really sort of um, I guess relevant to what's currently going on in your life um, so um, you can sort of see my mental progression through the game like if you knew the order I made these in you'd see how I was slowly losing my mind in the creation of this um, but like um, because I was making the music first. I just sort of thought about events in my life or images I've experienced that would fit the sort of music I was working with at that point. So, and the the driving thing um, on I ninety four around like three four a.m. There are no like police on the highway, um, and there's like the express lane. Like you're from Chicago, so you know. So there's like the express lane between, and there's no police there because they're usually on the actual highways. So if you go around like three a.m., there's people racing down there all the time, and I do that all the time in my Volvo. Is how I relieve stress. Um, uh, I mean, I drive at the speed limit. You know, uh, well, how long is the statute of like limitations? Uh, anyway, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that, that that game is directly biographical, and that like I do have a Volvo, and and the the gearing, like I programmed the gearing exactly how it is, and engine sounds were recorded. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Any other questions? Have any other questions for Rob? Uh, Rob, yeah, could you oh. tell us whether or not you you have a some kind of actual political message in the game, or whether um, or not it's it's just it, it uh, wasn't intentional, but <laughs> almost everyone I've talked to talks about it. Yeah. Um, I guess if you, like, I guess if you combine my talk and my game, you can sort of see where I sit politically. Um, I'm a patriot at heart, but um, I'm critical. If that's what, yeah, whatever. Is that all? Okay. Can finally get off this <laughs> stage. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Everybody, give Rob a hand.